we are literally smack dab in the middle. I know we did two last week, and then we've got uh, three more to do. Uh, so today and the next two weeks, where we're walking through our church's five core convictions. Now, I mentioned this last time that I don't really like the phrase core convictions because the gospel are our core convictions, and people who, you know, people who, oh, what do you mean these are your core convictions? Like, shouldn't the gospel? Yes. And what we're really looking at is what differentiates us as a congregation and us as a family of churches than other family of churches, other congregations out there. What is it that makes us distinct or unique? And that's why I like to call them our core distinctives. Amen? Amen. And uh, today we're going to dive into number three, discipling is a command of God and not optional. Discipling is a command of God, not optional. So we're going to dive in, uh, in a big way, into this topic. Um, for those of you that, uh, that look on our website, you'll see some basic information about this, which even if there's one passage in the Bible that talks about it, well, if it's a command, we should operate that way, yeah. right? Uh, but actually, there's Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Colossians 1, 28, 29, John 15, 15. There's quite a few other passages here in this. So I'm not going to dive into what's on the website because you can go to the website and see that for yourself. Uh, we're going to look at some other passages that deal with this whole thing. But let me give a little bit of a background of what we already have gone through last week. So last week, we dove into our first two core convictions. The first one is that we are a Bible church, not just a New Testament church, right? There's a lot of denominations out there that are strictly New Testament. The Old Testament's cool. Yeah, let's look at some stories about David and Goliath and, you know, like my nephew calls it the Pritchy Itchy, you know, the Prince of Egypt. And because that's right. The Prince of Egypt is in the Bible, right? Not as the Prince of Egypt, but, you, you know, it's cool. Probably the best, you know, adaptation of that, in my opinion, that's animated anyway. But you've also got, you know, all the other Daniel and the lion's den, those kind of things, right? But the Old Testament is more than just some cool stories. It's actually relevant to us today. Why? Because the first century church didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the letters and Revelation and all that. They were writing it as they were building the church. So what was their Bible? What were their scriptures? It was the Old Testament. And then over time, as different writers would write their letters or write their gospels or things like that, they started to become part of what the apostles taught, uh, even what Paul was taught, right? We know that Peter even said, hey, you know, people manipulate the scriptures just like they, or Paul's writings, just like they do the other scriptures, meaning Paul's writings had become, at that point, scripture. And so we're a Bible church, not just a New Testament church. Uh, the second one was, we are silent where the Bible speaks, and we speak where the Bible is silent. Uh, this might seem really weird, maybe, to some people, or it might just seem like, well, yeah, duh, if the Bible says it, we just be quiet and do it. That's the point, Right? If the Bible says that we should do something or not do something, we just follow what the Bible says. But God has given us creative license in biblical principle, in line with God's will, where there's not a direct command or an inference or an example of thou shalt do it this way. God gives us our own creative license to be able to come up with creative ways to do things. And a great example of that is uh, how do we fulfill the Great Commission? It's very clear from the scriptures that we are to go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples until the end comes, right? right, right. But how do we do that? Jesus doesn't say, uh, well, you start here in Los Angeles, and then from there you go to Bakersfield. Just kick your way up the five, and then, uh, you know, once you get to Vancouver, you've gone too far because, you know, those Canadians, we want them to, they got their own thing going on, so we'll, we'll go back down. No, he doesn't say any of that. And thank goodness, because, uh, you know, I got some Canadian friends. They need Jesus. You know what I mean? But we have creative license to go, okay, well, the Bible says that Jesus in Acts 1 says, hey, go from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So 
we kind of have an epicenter of our family of churches there in L.A. and from L.A. that was the broader area of Los Angeles, right? That was kind of the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then becomes really California in the southwestern United States, and then the ends of the earth, well, where is that? The ends of the earth. Okay, let's, let's go to Toronto. Let's go to Paris. Let's go to London. Let's go to these places, right, and plant churches. So where the Bible speaks, we are just silent. We, 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 we just obey the Bible. Where the Bible's silent, we use biblical principle, precedent, and pattern to be able to then discern what should we do and how should we do it. But everything is informed by Scripture. Amen? Amen. 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 When people ask us what makes us different as a church, and again, like I said, while these are, are called our core convictions, I like to call them our core distinctives, really these came about to differentiate uh, because w- back in when the, uh, uh, the international Christian churches came about, People were like, well, what's the difference between you and this church that you guys came out of? We're like, well, here it is, you know? And so they became really what makes us stand out. The reality, though, is that more than just what makes us different than other churches or other family of churches, this is really what we as a church practice and expect one another to practice, right? right? Is that we have these same core convictions, amen? Amen. It's not necessarily that other churches don't do these, right? We'll get into one next week about central leadership and the central leader. The Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, there's a ton of churches that have a central leader and have a central leadership team, but that doesn't mean they're right. That doesn't mean they're following God. The difference is is that all of these churches all over should be following all of, not just these core convictions, but the whole entire scriptures. Amen? Amen? These are what every church should be doing. So it is in these distinctives that what separates us from other churches around us. Amen? Amen. I, I want you all to understand something that I've known uh, for uh, many, many years. My brother-in-law taught this to me a long time ago as a biblical precedent, is that as a Christian, specifically in our family of churches, and I've been to a lot of churches, I've talked to a lot of pastors, I've studied the Bible with a lot of ministers. The reality is that within six months of being a disciple in our family of churches, you know more Bible than most ministers in the pulpit. Because of how rigorous and how much training is involved in helping somebody become a disciple, not just that, but also in helping to keep them a disciple and then teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded, right? Right. Oftentimes, I find that we go into Bible studies and we're kind of sheepish and mousish, not mousish, and just kind of like, oh, well, you know, hey, um, if you want to obey this, you know, here it is, you know, it's your choice, it's your choice. I don't write the mail, I just deliver it. I say that all the time, so I'm making fun of myself a little bit. But the reality is you have confidence, you should have a godly confidence that you, you actually know Scripture. Go to 1 Timothy 4.16. 1 Timothy 4.16, a passage we all know. It says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. We care a lot about how we live, but also we care a lot about what we believe. 1 Timothy 4.16. We care about both, and both are important to us. It's not just important that you know things. Knowledge is irrelevant if not put into action. Everybody who smokes cigarettes knows that they're going to get cancer from the cigarette. They know this, but do they stop? No. So knowledge is irrelevant. You can know about the Bible. You can know doctrine. You could parse adverbs in Greek and all these different kinds of things, and you're still just as lost as somebody who's out there living the most audacious pagan lifestyle in the world. It doesn't matter what you know. It matters what you do. It matters that you put these things into practice. And that's the difference, my brothers and sisters, between a disciple and somebody out there who just claims to be a Christian. We know from John 8, 31, 32, it says to the Jews who had believed him, 
Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's not about just knowing the truth. It's actually obeying the truth, and in obeying the truth, that's what sets you free. We study the Bible all the time with people that are just head there, head out. Yep, yep, you know what? I, I agree. That's cool. Awesome, awesome. And they never become disciples. Their hearts never change. Why? Because they actually aren't putting it into practice. This applies to you and I because we as disciples have an emphasis of not just learning the doctrine, but obeying the doctrine. And in so doing, Jesus promises that we will know the truth, and in that truth, we will be set free. That's not just knowing the truth that gets us saved, right? The knowledge of salvation, but it's also the knowledge of the scriptures to be able to help one another live it out. Now, it's confidence. You should feel confidence when speaking and studying the Bible with people on campus or in your workplace or anywhere. Because why? You know the truth. You know the truth. We have confidence in the Lord. It's not arrogance in your own knowledge. Because we always have to remember, 1 Corinthians 8, 1, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. So what's the core difference between us and other churches? We actually expect people to obey the Bible. That's it. That's it. If you want one core conviction out of all of these, we actually expect people to obey the Bible. Yeah. Which is why we get people into Bible studies. Because here's the thing. You could have gone to church your entire life. I did. And I was under a lot of really good, cool teaching. I could, you know, quote scripture with the best of them. But was I saved? No. Because I didn't have anyone in my life to actually help me and teach me and disciple me into actually obeying the scriptures. A lot of churches teach the Bible but they do not call each other to actually obey it. And this is the big problem, because you and I, like everybody else in this world, are prideful. And we don't like people telling us what to do. How dare you tell me what to do? Who are you to tell me what to do? But this is the principle of discipling. Being in a discipling relationship and being discipled. We are called not just to obey, but also to call others to obey the Word of God. You know, in our Western culture, is founded, like this nation is founded on rebellion. Wow. It's founded on rebellion. Now, I, I, I'm kind of, ex I'm fired up about that because it allows us to be here at a public college campus, having the Bible open, talking about God, right? So there's, there's good aspects to rebellion and there's bad aspects to rebellion. When we're rebelling against, uh, you know, regimes that refuse to let us obey the word of God, then that's, there's some good rebellion there. But if we're rebelling for the sake of rebelling, then that's not good. That's not a biblical attitude to have. But our society elevates rebellion. Look at our society today. You got people that are rebelling against parents, rebelling against uh, police and teachers, we got people that are rebelling, not even to mention rebelling against the Word of God and God's plans for their life. Again, that's not a biblical attitude. Right. Being rebellious is not a biblical attitude, but that is what is put before us every day through social media, through television, through movies, and any, any other media. It's the cult of individualism. It's I'm more important than the group. I don't have to obey anything higher than my own wants and needs and appetites and feelings and desires. This is altogether uniquely Western. China, the collective is more important than the individual. Now, I think they've taken a little too far, called communism, and that's not a good situation. But if you look in most of our Latin cultures, what, what is it? It's, it's we take care of the family, right? It's not an individual, right? In, uh, in India, you have gurus, and people will literally give up everything to follow a guru and say, hey, just t tell me whatever I need to do, and they will do it. So many other cu cultures do not have this individualism, individualistic lifestyle. It's, it's arguably really in the West. And so in the West, this discipling idea is really, really frowned upon. 
and we get a lot of grief. Other churches don't get so much grief about this. They're like, yeah, so? Yeah, I need somebody in my life. No problem, <laughs> you know? But we in America, in particular, the Western world, have a big problem with it. So tonight we're going to do a deep dive and see what the Bible has to say about this subject of discipling and having discipling relationships. So, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Point number one is discipling was taught in the Old Testament. Discipling was taught in the Old Testament. From childhood, are you just meant to kind of like figure out life on your own? Like what if, what if Val just like, you know, like left Giannis out, outside in the courtyard over there to come over here for, for midweek and was like, hey, you got it, buddy? Cool. All right, I'm out. Right? I mean, that, that's like, like you wouldn't, th- we laugh. We laugh about this <laughs> because we know it's ridiculous. But yet somehow when it comes to the scriptures, we like, no, don't, don't tell me what to do. Don't make me obey. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Notice it says, talk about them when you get home. You notice it doesn't say, play video games when you get home. The Bible calls us to impress these things, these commands, these teachings of God on our children. When you impress them, that creates an impression. That means it's going to leave a mark. Proverbs 23, write this down. Proverbs 23, 13 through 14 says, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod to save them from death. Right? There's not many parents in this room, but those of us that are, we understand that we've all gone through that phase where it's like, I don't know that I want to discipline, give my, give my son or daughter discipline, meaning pow pals or a little spank, because I'm afraid I'm going to hurt them. You will hurt them. That's the point. The Bible is clear. You need to discipline or disciple your kids or they will become entitled brats. We're not talking about abuse. As parents, we are not to do this in anger. And the Bible says they will not die if you give them a spank on the bottom when it's necessary. For those of us who have received this kind of discipline, most of us look back on our parents who have given us that kind of discipline and we respect them for it. We're like, you know what? I was was an absolute nincompoop, man. Like, I deserved it. In fact, I deserved worse. And we respect them for it. Now, that's not everybody's story, so don't hear what I'm not saying. But for those of us that that is our story, we can look back and go, you know what? Yeah, I needed that. We as disciples, especially parents who are disciples, have the opportunity to do it the right way where our parents blew it. But we've got to do it the biblical way. This is called discipling. It's called discipline. Not in every case. Again, like I said, some have been abused under the guise of discipline, but again, most of us look back and are grateful. In our Western society, people are just flabbergasted at the thought of discipling or disciplining our children. That we, we think we can like sit down with them with a with a four-year-old and like have a have a conversation and go, hey, you know, that it's probably not a good idea. You probably shouldn't do that. No, no, don't do that. And you cannot negotiate with a four-year-old. We do not negotiate with little terrorists. That's kids, I love kids. Kids are crazy. They're crazy. Those of you that work with kids, you know this. They're crazy. And you always can tell the ones whose parents discipline them and the ones who don't. And the ones who don't. Right? So again, again, here's the thing. We get this from a humanistic parental perspective. We understand this. It's in the Bible. This is what the Bible calls training and discipling a child. But what about as they mature? 
What about becoming maybe a spiritual adult? What do we do? Well, the idea doesn't change as people get older in the scriptures. Yet I think it changes for our minds. Well, I'm older now. I, uh, I've, I've, I've aged. I re- I've received wisdom. Every father trained his or her own children. Then they went on to learn from leaders in their community in various ways. Right? Here's a list of some spiritual and mature men training others in the Old Testament. This is not an exhaustive list, but here's some of the big ones. Abraham and his nephew Lot, Genesis 12. Abraham grabs his nephew, says, hey, we're going to go to this promised land that God's called me to go. You want to come? Cool. All right. Takes him under his wings, shows him some things, right? Exodus, you got Moses and Joshua. You've got in 1 Kings, Elijah and Elisha. In 2 Kings, you've got Elisha and Gehazi. All the way down, you can see this over and over and over and over, this biblical pattern. All the way to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist... Who does he disciple? His disciples. Literally, that's what he called them. I'm a disciple of John the Baptist. He trains them in the Gospels. A more mature and spiritual man has someone under him to help train that person to do the same thing. Again, it's not just childhood, father and son. But as you mature, you get other disciples to help you mature in other ways. Now, These are some good examples. Those are just some good examples. But the Old Testament is full of examples of men and women who threw off discipling, who threw off the yoke of having somebody train them and teach them in in their lives. And the Bible gives us both good examples and bad examples so that we can learn from both, so that we can kind of tell the difference. Wow, that went really well. That probably is a good thing to go. Wow, that's terrible. I'm not following that example. That's bad. Romans 15, verse 4 says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So, Lot and Abraham. It's going really well for Lot and Abraham. Then all of a sudden, Lot and Abraham's people have a fight. And Abraham kind of blew it here in his discipling relationship with Lot. And instead of like trying to work it out, he says, All right, Why don't you guys go over there, we'll go over here, no problem. Which wasn't a good idea. Because Lot gets a little bit too close to Sodom and Gomorrah, ends up getting like uh, uh, captured and imprisoned, who had to go rescue him, Abraham, brings him back. But then he goes back (laughs) and then lives in Sodom and Gomorrah, and then the rest is history. That's Genesis 13 and 14, you can read that on your own. Not a good situation. Not a good... That led all the way to uh, him uh, living in the mountains with his daughters. His daughters, afraid that they're not going to have kids, have an incestuous relationship with their dad, creates Moab, a whole drama situation there. Not good. Not good. You have Korah's rebellion in number 16. Korah and his sons and his friends said, you know what, Moses, who made you, like, ruler over us? God. What, like, do well, you think you're better than us? No. This is just the way God did it. It's me and, me and Aaron, we're going to do this thing. I mean, you got your role, no problem. They wanted to have the role. They wanted to be equals with Moses. And so Korah led this rebellion, and God literally kills all of them. Literally, the ground opens up. You know what I mean? I can hear Moses, like if you go read it, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting story, number 16. But if you read it, Abraham's like, you know what, hey, or not Abraham, but Moses is like, hey, if, if God wants me to be the leader, he's going to make it so. And so what he's going to do is he's going sw- to open the ground and he's going to swallow up anybody who he doesn't think is the leader. <laughs> I can see him just like trying to make up like the wackiest thing he could possibly imagine because he had, he'd prayed for them, like... This isn't good. You know what I mean? And guess what God did? Right there. So Korah wanted to be independent from Moses, and he threw off that leadership. Then you had Gehazi under Elisha. Gehazi ends up leaving Elisha, that relationship, and ends up being under a really bad king and suffering under a really bad king. You find that in 2 Kings verse 8, or chapter 8. And the entire book of Judges 
is all about what do God's people do when they are under authority and what do they do when they buck authority. And it's like this massive up and down and up and down. Things go really well when they're under discipling and then it goes really bad when they're not. Judges 17, check this out. Judges 17, look here in verse 5. Judges 17, 5. It says, now this man Micah had a shrine or an idol, right? This isn't like a shrine of God or anything. And he made an ephod and some household gods and installed one of his sons as a priest. And then it's interesting, this last sentence. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. No leader, no discipling. This led to the worship of made-up gods. Why? Because everyone did what they thought was best rather than what God wanted them to do. We do not allow children to do whatever they want. And as we grow up, these same types of relationships are all around us. And yet, when it comes to matters deeper we decide to follow our heart. We just trust our own truth. Rather than, and we we go back to the cult of individualism. It's all about what I think. It's all about what I want. And we throw God out the window, even though we understand fundamentally that we all need teaching. We all need training. We all need authority in our lives to help us live the life that God wants us to live. Sometimes when we become adults, we like have this entirely different philosophy of how this is supposed to operate. It's not the way that God intended or designed us to operate. Again, all the way through the Old Testament, there was an expectation for all to accept consistent discipling. This was so that the family of God would have a structure and that everyone's needs would get met. Go to Exodus chapter 18. Let's look, at, let's look at the original, original discipling here. The original setup. This is seen in the advice given to Moses by his father-in-law, Jethro. Exodus 18, look here in verse 19. This is Jethro talking. He says, listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to Him, teach them His decrees and instructions, and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. Does that sound like discipling? But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves." That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you'll be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. First, you have the Jethro discipling Moses here, calling to obey what God wanted him to. And then he takes two to three million people and divides them into groups of a thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, all the way down to the family unit. Then there is a consistency of teaching because as Moses teaches the smaller units and smaller units, they just keep teaching it down so that everybody's needs will get met. So when the physical kingdom was set up, discipling was right here in the beginning. It's also a personal safeguard in the Old Testament. Discipling is a personal safeguard to keep our hearts soft and away from sin. It's all over the Old Testament. Just a few examples. Proverbs 12, verse 1. Write that down. Proverbs 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Stupid is a biblical word. Obviously, we don't want to hate correction. It's not a good situation. Proverbs 19, verse 20. Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. Sounds like a good situation. In Proverbs 27, verse 5, better an open rebuke than a hidden love. Better an open rebuke than a hidden love. It's better to be like rebuked than for somebody to say that they love you 
but not say anything at all. If somebody really loves you, they're going to tell you the truth. So it's better to get hit with that truth than to operate where it's like, ah, I just, just don't want to hurt their feelings. You know, I, now that doesn't mean we're mean about it, but you know, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So there is a constant theme all throughout the Old Testament of being discipled, challenging other people to be more godly. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's skip into the New Testament. Discipling, point number two, discipling is Jesus' method to save the world. Discipling is Jesus' method to save the world. As disciples of Jesus, as Christians, we're called to follow Jesus. He is our standard, correct? Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Look here in verse 14. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. It says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Here's the core principle of Jesus. Jesus expected people to repent, to follow him, and to be trained by him. Yeah, well, that was Jesus, you know, like he was God and stuff, right? I mean, that's different. At this time, they didn't have a conviction that Jesus was God. He was just some rabbi dude that was calling him to follow him. And you know what they did? They did it. They repented, and they followed him, and they became fishers of men. What did he call them to do? Number one, repent. He told them to change things in their life that did not line up with the Word of God. That's what he said. Stop sinning. Stop this thought process. He called them to repent. Repentance is not just, uh, 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 I, I repent. Okay, we'll prove it. Show it with your life being changed. Repentance is metanoia in the Greek. It's a change of mind that results in a change of behavior. Okay? So he called them to repent. Then he said, follow me. Be around me. Do what I do. Say what I say. He called them to imitate him. That'll come back to us here in a little bit. And then he says, I will send you out. He's like, hey, you're not going to go where you want to go. I'm going to send you somewhere. Wait, 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 wait. I don't want to go there. I'm going to send you out. Well, I, but my, my, my family, I'm going to send, I, I'm going I'm to send you out. I'm going to tell you, go here and you're going to go. Amen. Jesus taught with authority because he is the truth and he gives us the truth. Matthew 7, 28 through 29 when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This is the problem with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Not only were they hypocrites, but they were lightweights when it came to accountability. So as Christians, we say, you need to obey this because it's the truth. But what is this? Is this the words of Eric? No, you obey this because it's the truth. My job is not just to teach the Bible. My job is to teach what the Bible says, calling myself and others to obey what the Bible says. Now, what's crazy is that this is not something that we just throw people into. A lot of churches do this. In fact, they say, hey, come up front, raise your hand, pray this prayer, say this little thing, do this little thing, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, now they come back and go, hey, uh, yeah, you got to change your life now. What? I'll th I, th I thought I had this get out of hell free card, which just said believe. I thought all I had to do was faith. And this is why we have Christianity that's as wacky and you know, messed up as we have today. What we do is we study the Bible with people. We help them get to understand, hey, these are the things that Jesus is going to call you to obey. And then we say, hey, what's your good confession? Jesus is Lord. Yeah. And what, is, what, are we say, what are they saying? Hey, they're saying, hey, this is my standard. He's my Lord. I do what he says. I go where he tells me to go. Right, right, right. 
I might not like it, but I get my heart behind it because it's Jesus. Mm. So that they actually know what they're getting themselves into. Mm. When people do not obey, we bring them back to the original conviction. Did you say Jesus is Lord? Yes, I said Jesus is Lord. All right, cool. Then you need to obey the Bible. This is why we study the Bible with people before they become disciples. Becoming a Christian isn't just a feeling or an emotion that you can follow what you want when you want. It's a real relationship that has expectations. Jesus used accountability to train his disciples. Write this down. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. This is why when I get with the guys that we're studying with other people, I say, hey, Malik, so how'd the study go? What'd you teach? What'd you expect from them? What'd you call them to? Why? Because it's my job to train these guys to make disciples. It's my job to train them to love people better. Jesus had a mission to accomplish, and he wanted to make sure that his guys were accomplishing that mission the way that he trained them to. So when I have accountability, when I'm talking to the guys, about what they're doing and teaching, that's all I'm doing. I'm imitating Jesus. Why? Because if we don't have an accountability, are we going to make it where we want to go? Like if you guys didn't have a grade for your classes, or you didn't have a goal at your job, would you meet the expectation? No. There's no accountability. Hey, just, just kind of show up and like walk around and do whatever you feel like you need to do to look busy and uh, we'll pay you. Give me that job. I'm with that. You know what I'm saying? But that's not the reality. That's not life, guys. Why would the church be any different? Why would God's standard be any different than some CEO or some director or something? Jesus is not interested in his guys getting disciples, but also to make sure that they taught the same principles of discipling and made sure that it, was a per, that it was perpetual, that it was ongoing to the next generation. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Well, what did you just command? Go and make disciples. So disciples make disciples, you make disciples, you make disciples, you make disciples. It's not a suggestion. He said to make them. Not encourage them, not to suggest to them, but make them. Now, we can't make anybody do anything. So that's not the kind of make we're talking about. But Jesus had an expectation of what we're supposed to do. Right. Now, what about abuse? Discipling is indeed a scary principle. It's a scary idea. Absolutely. Because men can abuse this biblical principle to their own ends. And we see examples of that all over. But we see examples of people like abusing their power and authority all over society. And there are a lot of people that say, hey, that's good. Good job. Keep doing that. I mean, here's the thing, guys. If, if the president does a bad job, do we just kind of say, you know what? No more presidents. We're done. No. We, we go and get another president. Every four years, we vote in another president. So if you didn't like this one, guess what? Vote for a different one. Right? We don't throw away the principle because of a bad character. Right? But yet people are all too willing to do this with discipleship. They're all too willing to do it because certain people have been abused in the past. And I, and I, don't, and I don't disagree with that. This is an upward call for all of us. You cannot use the excuse of what others have done wrong to throw out what God calls right. It is an upward call for all of us to love others and to willingly give ourselves to be better men and women so that we can show great love in our discipling of other people. People knew that the disciples had been permanently changed by their discipling relationship with Jesus. Acts chapter 4 verse 13. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It was obvious that these guys, in and of themselves, had nothing 
to make them special, nothing to make them stand out from the world around them, except for the fact that they had spent time being discipled by Jesus. All right, so that's the Old Testament. That's Jesus' ministry. Let's talk about the New Testament church. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Discipling was taught throughout the New Testament church. Ephesians chapter 6. Just like in the Old Testament, we start in the same place with the family. Ephesians 6 verse 1. Children, obey your parents and Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Paul here is quoting the Ten Commandments. Same principle in the Old Testament, so in the New. That's why we're a Bible church, amen? Amen. This same thing applies in marriage. Go up a little bit to Ephesians 5. Look here in verse 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body for which he is a savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Now, there's a lot more here. So, sisters, don't worry about it. We get get ours too, okay? Uh, But just know, this is where it begins. Who's the head of the family? Who's the head of the household? The husband. Who disciples his wife? The husband, right? Contrary to what many might think is that I am Ariel's primary discipler. We are discipled by Fernando and Jackie, who lead our sister church in San Francisco. However, as awesome as Fernando and Jackie are, as awesome as Jackie is, I am the one who disciples Ariel primarily. Now, she gets a ton of advice. She gets a ton of discipling from Jackie. But I'm Ariel's primary discipler. So when you marry, sisters, marry well, because you're marrying your discipler. (laughs) Amen? Amen. We see this principle in the family. We see this principle also in the church. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Home stretch, guys. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look here in verse 16. This is where it gets really scary. Okay? This is where it gets really scary. I know Halloween was yesterday, but this is, this is really scary. 1 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore I urge you to imitate me. For this reason I have sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul is writing to a church who's really blown it. And he's going, guys, I planted you. What's your problem? You guys need to imitate me. But because you can't imitate me, I can't be there. I'm in jail. Uh, I'm going to send you Timothy. And Timothy is awesome. In fact, Timothy is so awesome that you won't even be able to tell the difference between whether Paul's there or Timothy's there because he's just like me. Here's the core principle of discipling. We are all called to be Christians. We know this, that the word Christian means little Christ. It was a derogatory term coined back in Antioch, but we've kind of, hey, I'll be a a little Christ, no problem. Little Jesus is walking around this world doing what he did, saying what he said, calling others to the same standard that he calls. God puts people in our lives to help us be better little Christs. And here's the fact. God has chosen who will disciple you. Like Ariel and I might like sit down and like look at the people in the church and go, okay, well, who would, who could, who could we match up here? Who'd be a great help to this person and that person? Who'd really help this person raise up in that particular area? But you know who's guiding all of that? God. I'm not saying like I'm like in a trance going, oh, Amani, Ariel, boom. No. But God orchestrates, God's either allowing it to happen or causing it to happen. He's that sovereign. 
He is in full control of people and places, everything. You are discipled by who you are discipled by because God knows what you need. God will give you someone to disciple you to give you what you need. Not always what you want, but what you need. When you don't grow under a person that God's given you, God has really two options. One option is that you either outgrow them. And so because you've outgrown that person, you need a new discipler to help you take it to the next level. Or if you refuse to listen to that person, God will give you a new discipler and prayerfully you'll be able to listen to that person's advice. Listen to that person's admonishment from the Lord. This is why God changes disciplers. There's only one of those reasons is good. I pray that all of the people that I disciple surpass me. I pray that on a regular basis. I'm not interested in like holding people down and Eric's got to be the guy. and that, that, pff, I ain't got time for that, man. You know what I mean? I, I wish we had 30 Maliks in this room. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, I lead a group of 30 people, right? The church is about 30 people right now, right? What if, what if we had every single one of the guys that I disciple able to lead a group of 30? I'd be like, all right, you handle it. I'm out. I'm going somewhere else. There's another 30 people that need Jesus. That's the purpose of this discipling. Right? More people get saved, and that's really what it's all about. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he goes on and says, Follow my example, in verse 1, as I follow the example of Christ. The reality is that you do not have to be exactly like your discipler. Now, when I was young in the faith, uh, it was kind of funny because there was preacher's clothes, right? Now, everybody's kind of growing up with their own idea of what preacher's clothes are, but it was khaki pants, a white shirt, and a blue blazer. And if, you're, if, you're, if you were discipled by the church leader, guess what you wore? And I didn't even try to. I didn't even go looking for it. It just happened. It just happened. Now, I can't say that I look good, but I think I did. I was a lot younger then, had a lot more hair. You know what I mean? But this idea of imitation, this idea of following the example of somebody else, it doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean you, 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 you dress the same, you, you talk the same, although you will find that that does happen. Right? You... Like, if you're really, like, engaged with your discipleship partner, you will begin to talk like them a little bit. Yeah. Right? This, this, the same thing happens in life with coaches or teachers that we admire. We begin to imitate parts of their life. But what does this say? This says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. This is a theme in both command and practice throughout Paul's writings. He calls them to imitate to be like, follow the Christ-like example of his life. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. We imitate the faith. We imitate the heart of those who lead us. Right? Don't imitate the bad things. We don't need any more of that. But imitate the heart. Imitate the good things. Right? As an example, I hope that Skylar and Ethan imitate the heart and faith of Jay as he's not just met the mission's goal, he's surpassed the mission's goal. And as Jay disciples Skylar and Ethan, right, that, that's an imitatable quality, right? Again, I mean, we just heard from Enrico, but the same goal for all of us, I would expect the Martinos. And they're a great example of generosity. I, I hope it's not just Enrico and Farron that go, hey, my discipler, man, they're really awesome. I'm going to be that generous. No, all of us should be, right? All of us can imitate those who lead us, even if they're not leading us directly. Amen? Yes. Hebrews 13, 17 says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. 
Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. Paul here is calling the church to submit to his and the other leaders who have authority in their lives. Why do this? Honestly, because it makes life so much easier. That's what he's saying. This would be of no benefit to you. So much of ministry, guys, just be honest, is opinion. Like, why do we meet on Wednesday? Because we meet on Wednesday. Like, why are you preaching about discipleship right now, man? Because uh, I chose to preach on discipleship, you know? Like, well, why? You know, it's like, like where there's a biblical precedent that we follow, <coughs> excuse me, we follow the Bible. But, <coughs> nope, the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt preach on, in November, these topics. No. Right? Sometimes it's like, hey guys, we're going to have an all-night prayer night tonight. Yeah. Pff, I don't like all-night prayer nights. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, all right. You know? Uh, we're going we're gonna to fast for this brother or this sister or this situation or that situation. I, I don't want to do that. Like, do you understand how, like, difficult that makes life? Not just for me as a leader, but for like the church to be disunified. If Ariel and I call you to something, or your 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 Bible talk leader calls you to something, your discipler calls you to something, and it's in the Bible, then we get our hearts behind it. Unless it's unbiblical, unethical, gonna hurt somebody or whatever, then yeah, let, hey, hey Eric, have you thought about the ethical implications of this? Now, I've called people to fast. Like, hey, guys, we're at church. You're going to fast for this, this, and this. I've never, ever said, this is how you should fast. Because there are people who clinically cannot fast from food or whatever. So can you fast from something? Right? Some of you, like, need to fast from, like, your phones. Like, there's not a, like, you're trying to have a conversation. And it's just like, boom, 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 boom. Like, like whoa, you're addicted, man. You're addicted. You've got screenitis or whatever it is. You know what I mean? But again, we, we, we just, we, we get behind it. We get behind the leadership. Because we know that our hearts are to help build the church, to build you up. We're trying to do great things for God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called the day so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Here's the obvious. Here's the obvious. We have a gravitational pull towards sin in this world. As hard as you try as a disciple of Jesus, you will still be feeling that tug of war, that gravitational pull to sin. It's our natural world. We need relationships in our lives to help us stay on the path, to help us stay on track. Proverbs 17, 17, classic coffee cup scripture right here. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I love to get sharpened. I need people in my life. And I love to get sharpened by anyone. We had a Bible study this morning, Adam, myself, and Gustavo. And afterwards, Gustavo and I were just kicking it. And he's like, bro, let me show you the scripture. I made this connection and that, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, man, that's awesome. Uh, guess what he did? He flat sharpened me. Taught me something I didn't know. Well, I didn't know that. That's cool. I think that happened the last time in our D time, too. I'm like, wow, I never put that together right there, man. That's pretty cool. I don't care that I disciple him. I don't care that I've been a Christian 24 years longer than him or that he's half my age. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. I, <laughs> true. True. This is why I disciple him, because I live vicariously through him and his hair. I want to be better. I want to grow. And in order for me to do that, I need men and women in my life who are willing to take the time to disciple me, to train me, to teach me, to show me the way better. Too many of us, when we're challenged, we look at the other person, we ask, who are you to challenge me? 
Those might not be the words that we say, but we're like, yeah, but, or what about, we, we always have, now, rebuttals are fine, but what's the heart posture? Hey, man, 100% behind it, no problem. I, I got a couple questions, though. How, how, how would it work with this? It's the heart posture. But too often we come with a heart posture of like, shields up. Who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you to challenge me? Well, who are you to get defensive? Like you think it's okay to get defensive, but it's not okay to somebody to challenge you? You can't have it both ways. It doesn't cut both ways. We all have to be humble. We should be humble to anyone, including those who disciple us and trust that the Holy Spirit works in them to help us just as much as it works in us to help ourselves grow. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, what about the women's ministry? We've got sisters in the house? All right. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. This does uh, separate us quite a bit from some uh, more mainline denominations, uh, what the Bible says about this. What about the women's ministry? Titus chapter 2, look here in verse 3. It says, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one would malign the word of God. Now, the emphasis here on husbands and children and stuff like that is because typically, if you weren't married or, and didn't have kids, you were still under your father's discipling. They did, right? Now, yes, my wife's job as an older woman in this church is to teach the younger women to be great wives when that time comes, to be great parents, you know, mothers when that time comes, right? But busy, kind, right? so that no one will align the way of the Word of God. I appreciate my wife and the discipling that she gives the women. I'm really excited. I mean, I've said this before, but I'm excited to go back to men's and women's midweeks because as much as I love teaching y'all sisters, there are just things that she can say that I can't say. And even if I tried to say them, it wouldn't be bad. It just probably wouldn't have the same effect, you know what I mean? And so I'm fired up that uh, she gets to go back and, and start teaching the women. Amen? So we do believe that women teach women. Women disciple the women. Right? Except for if you're in a married relationship where the husband disciples the wife. Does that make sense? Amen. What about leaders? Leaders in the church. 2 Timothy 2. A couple more here. A couple more here. 2 Timothy 2. Paul's calling Timothy, and he says, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Did I say 2 Timothy 2? Well, if you're there, keep your finger there, because we'll go there next. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 is this one. Thank you. You notice it doesn't say suggest the word. It doesn't say encourage the word. It says preach the word. God always puts things in order. You know, sometimes you need a good correction. But if that correction doesn't have the effect that God wants it to have, sometimes we need a nice rebuke. But after you've given a nice rebuke, what should we do? We go and encourage. Hey, man, we got this. I know this is a tough situation that you're in. I know this is a tough call. I know that God is really trying to put you in a position where you really raise up and grow in your character. But you can do this, yeah. right? An opportunity for encourage. This is why I love the Bible. Everything is in it has a meaning and a purpose. We are expected to challenge and train the church. That's a leader's job. It's my role as a minister. It's a core way that I help the church grow. But it also applies to each and every one of us who disciple one another and who are disciples. 
And this is, to be, this is to be an ongoing pattern in the church. Now, 2 Timothy 2. Verse 1, it says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So, I find a reliable person in Frankie. Frankie finds a reliable person in Gonzalo. Gonzalo's job then is to find a reliable person that he can train up. And in training up that person, then Gonzalo helps that guy train up and find another guy to train up. And it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going until the world is full of the good news of Jesus Christ. We grow as disciples. We grow as Bible talks. We grow as churches. And the world is filled with disciples. What are some examples of disciples in the New Testament? Well, you've got Barnabas, who initially disciples Paul, and then Paul outgrows that relationship, and then Paul then ends up discipling Barnabas. That's Acts 11, 12, and 13. Paul obviously disciples Timothy. We've looked at that. Acts 20 is where that discipling relationship begins. First and second Timothy are byproducts of that. He disciples Titus. The book of Titus is in is a byproduct of that. He disciples a guy named Silas, Acts 17. He's kicking it with Silas. Church history tells us that Peter even discipled John Mark, which is how we get the book of Mark. Because Peter dictated to John Mark, who wrote the book of Mark. So we see, indeed, that discipling is not optional. It is a command of God. But many people are afraid of discipling because they're afraid of getting hurt by people. And you know what? Again, I hurt. I, I, I get it. I've been hurt before. I totally understand. can totally relate. People are afraid of being hurt unrighteously and wrongly. Why? Because we're sinners. We're sinners. And I can totally relate to this fear. As a sinner, have I ever challenged somebody wrongly? Have I ever been harsh with somebody or, or not? Uh, uh, rebuked enough or, or not given the right discipling? I have, unfortunately. I have. But here's what's cool, is that God has allowed me to ask for forgiveness and to show love to those people that I've blown it with. And it has helped me to become more godly and more humble and to learn how to love others better. Here's what's really cool, though. I've also received some pretty wonky discipling in my day. Like, I'm talking bad stuff. Nothing like, you know, that's going to like hurt me really in the grand scheme of things. Obviously, I'm okay, you know. But like some really dumb discipling. And here's what's cool. God has allowed this so that I can learn to love them and forgive them and be more like Jesus in their life. Either side is not given a reason to give up the principle that God has that we've seen here in the scriptures. It is scary. But you know what's cool? Jesus never asked us to do anything that he himself didn't do. Who was Jesus discipled by? God. Read John 12. Read John 17. He's like, I and the Father are one. He and I, we do this. Him and I, we're doing this. He told me to say this. I said this. He told me to do this, I did this. What is he doing? He's taking discipling from his dad, from God. And we must do the same. Some people say that we're a cult because we try to control people. Well, that's the way the world sees it. Because all we're really trying to do is to teach them to obey the word of God, which is exactly what Jesus called us to do. If people do not want to obey then they will feel controlled to obey. On the other hand, if they want to obey, they'll feel grateful that they have men and women in their lives who love them enough to help them obey and call them to the standard of Jesus. I mean, think about this for a minute. If you're on a basketball team and the coach says, we're, we're going to play uh, the A-B play. And, and you know he gives that to the, the team captain, typically the point guard. Huddle up, boom, we're going to do this. Okay, we're running. What would, what would you guys think if a team member was like, I don't want to do that, it's dumb. <laughs> Excuse me? 
No, what's our goal? Our goal is to win. If that play is going to help us win, let's play. Now you're not, stop controlling me, coach. Stop telling me what to do. And we're just like, what? Again, here's what's wonky, guys. We get this in the world. But as soon as you drape Jesus or the Bible over this principle, which really came from Jesus and the Bible anyway, people freak out. We freak out. Stop controlling me. I'll go where I want. We, we don't say that to a coach. Why would we say that to Jesus? It's ridiculous. Again, when we make a human analogy, people get it right away. But when we put the Bible onto it, people freak out and say, that doesn't apply to me. It's sad because we as disciples must have deep convictions from the Bible that this is true and must be followed for our, God, for our good and God's glory. And it's the only way the world gets won. It was Jesus' plan. So discipling is a command of God and is not optional. Discipling is taught from the beginning of God's movement, as we see in the Old Testament, as seen in part of his plan from the beginning. Discipling was Jesus' method to save the world, and so it should also be ours. The principle of discipling was taught and exemplified throughout the New Testament. Jesus called his followers disciples, as the word disciple means someone who is following the ways of another. That's literally what the word disciple means. It means to be disciplined in the ways of another. Because sin is deceitful and our hearts are deceitful, none of us have become perfect like Jesus. We never get on this side of heaven to the point where we can live without discipling. You cannot go, well, I've matured past the point of needing somebody in my life. We need discipling in our lives to stay saved and to make it to heaven. When you say you do not believe in discipling, you're really saying that you do not believe in God and his word. My family, we believe that discipling is a command of God and is not optional, and therefore we make it our aim and goal to help each other in discipling relationships to obey the word of God. We teach it and expect it. This is core conviction number three. Amen? Amen. Amen. I love you guys very much.